I bet you've never seen this before. It's a transparent OLED display. I'm probably the first person to... Okay, so you've seen it before. But I bet you've never seen a transparent OLED being used as a clock. I can't imagine anyone. Okay, so that's been done to death as well. Why am I even bothering to show you this? There's no denying it is pretty cool, and there are some impressive things you can do, like stacking multiple displays to make a 3D display. However, what I find exciting about this project is that the date and time are correct. Now I can already hear your mouse moving to click away from this video, but stick with me. I can remove power from the microcontroller and it automatically knows what the time is when power is restored. The microcontroller I'm using, the ESP32, doesn't have a built-in real-time clock and there's no battery backup. So how does this work? I can see you're still not impressed. We've got used to knowing what the time is. Our computer shows it all the time and so does our phone. But how do they actually know what the time is? Would you believe me if I said my ESP32 was getting its time from an atomic clock? Would you still believe me if I told you that my ESP32 is probably getting its time from multiple atomic clocks that are orbiting the Earth at around 14,000 kilometers per hour? Let me introduce you to the Network Time Protocol, or NTP. This is what I'm using in my clock, and it's most likely what your computer and phone is using as well. But first, I want to give a quick plug to PCBWay who sponsor the channel. I've got a bunch of videos coming up using PCBs that I've had manufactured by them, so don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss anything. So what is the Network Time Protocol? Wikipedia says, the Network Time Protocol, NTP, is a networking protocol for clock synchronization between computer systems over packet-switched variable latency data networks. Now, what's impressive about this protocol is that it's been in operation since before 1985. It's one of the oldest internet protocols in current use. It's probably been around longer than a lot of you have been alive. How does it actually work? Well, the first thing you need is some accurate clocks. The most accurate clocks we've managed to create are atomic clocks. There are a few flavours of these. We can use vibrating cesium atoms. These vibrate at 9,192,631,770 times per second. That's a very big number. Another popular choice is to use rubidium, and you also have the very excitingly named hydrogen maser clock. Obviously, not everyone has an atomic clock lying around. They are pretty expensive. So a lot of people rely on global navigation satellite systems such as GPS. A typical GPS satellite will have up to four atomic clocks on board. We can use these atomic clocks to create our own accurate clock. These super accurate clocks are known in the NTP world as Stratum Zero devices. They don't offer any time services over the network, they just provide the time. Connected directly to the Stratum Zero devices, we have Stratum One devices. These devices do offer time synchronization services over the network. Below these we have Stratum 2 devices. These devices are connected over a network connection to Stratum 1 devices. And below these we have Stratum 3 devices. This goes on to a maximum level of Stratum 15. Stratum 16 indicates that the device is not synchronized and you shouldn't use it. So let's have a look at this in action. We can install an application called Wireshark on our computer. This lets us look at all the network traffic that is being generated on our network. The NTP protocol runs over UDP port 123, so we can tell Wireshark that we only want to see this traffic. Let's generate some requests to an NTP server. We can see the packet going out from our computer, and we can see the response coming back in. If we look in the response, we can see that we are talking to a Stratum 1 device. And we can also see that it got its time from GPS. We just got time from some atomic clock in orbit around the Earth. That's pretty mind-blowing. In the response, there are also four timestamps. The reference, origin, receive and transmit timestamps. These are used by our computer to compensate for network delays. We have the delay due to sending a packet from our computer to the server, and we have the delay from the server sending a packet back to our computer. The origin timestamp is the time the request left our computer. 
The receive timestamp is the time the request arrived at the server, the transmit timestamp is the time the server sent its reply, and our computer also records the timestamp the reply arrived. From these four timestamps, we can estimate the network delay using this formula. We can also estimate the offset from our local clock to the server clock. These values can then be used to adjust the local clock so that it matches the correct time. Now in most applications, having the time change can have a disastrous effect, particularly if time goes backwards. Imagine we're collecting a sequence of events coming into our system. If the time on our machine goes backwards, our events will suddenly be recorded in a different order from when they occurred. To prevent this, most systems will gradually adjust the local clock to match the server time and won't allow time to go backwards. Obviously for this to work, you need to be starting with a time that is already almost correct. So this is all pretty complicated. How do we actually use it on the ESP32? Well, there's actually only two lines of code required, and these two lines is all the code that's going to be in this video. First, we need to tell the system which NTP server we want to use. And then once we've done that, we can just use this line of code to get the time. This will automatically refresh the time from the time server. That's all we need to do, it's magic. Now you may have noticed that I'm using a pool of machines to get my time. This is much more reliable than using just one machine, as an individual machine may go down and you won't be able to get the time. But it's two lines of code to connect to an atomic clock. That's pretty cool, if you ask me. There is one last thing that's worth mentioning. A natural thought is to assume that you should always try and connect to a Stratum 1 device, as that should have the most accurate time. It is, after all, very close to the accurate clocks. The problem with this thought is that it ignores any network delays. A Stratum 1 device may be quite far away from you in terms of network hops, and the route from your machine to the server may be completely different from the route back from the server to your machine. This can introduce quite a large error into your calculations. It may be much more sensible to connect to a higher stratum device. These may be closer to you and may be hosted by companies that have high speed direct connections to somewhere closer to a lower stratum device. The other thing to bear in mind is that you might be connecting to a server that's overloaded if you all try and connect to the same stratum 1 device. This could cause your time to be completely out of whack as the server might be struggling to actually serve all the requests that are coming in. So it's much better to use either a pool of machines or use a time server that isn't a Stratum 1 device. So I hope this was interesting. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.